Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone watching the show. I'm delighted to welcome to the program His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn. He is the rector of Most Holy Trinity Seminary, a pre-Vatican II Roman Catholic seminary, which is located in Reading, Pennsylvania. He was ordained a priest in 1975 by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and was consecrated by Bishop Robert McKenna, a Dominican priest who was himself consecrated by Bishop Gerard de Laurier, a very eminent Catholic Dominican theologian. He is also the Superior General of Roman Catholic Institute. Your Excellency, welcome to the show. Thank you. So the theme for today's show is the Catholic family. And in today's modern world, it's increasingly difficult to just find information for traditional Catholics or families who are mm -hmm. trying to uh, do what the traditional Catholic way of raising a family was in the past. So I'm very excited, uh, Your Excellency, that we can talk about this subject. And I think we should start with probably the most important question, which is, what is the primary purpose of a marriage? The primary purpose of marriage or matrimony, the sacrament of matrimony, is the procreation and education of children. Uh, and when we say education, we don't mean merely their book learning, but we mean their upbringing, their moral training, uh, because the parents have to continue the, uh, they have to do the mortification that is required of the child who cannot do it himself after baptism. See, baptism takes away original sin, but does not remove the effects of original sin. So the child merely knows his instincts. And if you permit a child to follow his instincts, he will grow up with all of these uh, vices that have been there since childhood. And by the time he's a teenager, you will not be able to take them away from him. He will be formed. And uh, so the parents, uh, therefore, by education, we mean the upbringing and the moral education of the child. Right. And so th that leads me to ask about separately the husband and the wife. What is, let's begin with the husband. What is the duty of the husband within a Catholic family? Well, the husband is the head of the house. He has the monarchical authority over the house. Uh, over the uh, all of the members of the family, uh, and though, though his powers are defined in the sense that uh, he cannot uh, order anything that is totally unreasonable, but Saint Paul says in all things, you know that wives have to be subject to their husbands in all things. But the moral theologians interpret that to mean. Uh, all things reasonable. For example, he could not force his wife to wear a bag over her head. Uh, it's, he could be unreasonable, and therefore it would not be a true command because it, it commands something unreasonable. Laws and commands, by their very nature, must be in accordance with reason. But uh, the so he can uh, command anything that he thinks is reasonable and w which is objectively in accordance with reason. Uh, and the, the rest of the members of the family must obey as they would uh, a, a command of God. You know, all authority comes from God, as St. Paul says, and so the authority of the husband and the father come from God, comes from God. And what, what are the duties of the wife in the family? The wife is the, now from Genesis, we know that she is the adjutor, as it says in, in Genesis. She is the helper of the husband. And she has a very prominent place, actually, because the uh, it's something like, uh, well, she does the day-to-day -day molding of the children. The, the husband has the authority to say what should be done and what rules should be observed, but usually he is not there. So she does the day-to-day -day sculpting, you might say, of the child, uh, his moral uh, outlook and his moral, his, his behavior. She applies all of those rules. So you know, she's not a slave. She's not doing something menial or, or uh, something that's below her. To the contrary, St. John Chrysostom said, if, if you brought a great sculptor back to life, uh, you would fill a stadium for the people that would want to see him. 
You know, if Michelangelo came back to life, he would fill up a stadium. But to a sculpt stone is nothing in comparison to the formation of a child. And she can for form him not only in natural good morals, but also, and more importantly, supernatural good morals, supernatural piety. Uh, she can make a saint out of him if she wants to, and if God gives the grace, such as the mother of St. John Bosco, uh, very famous for her sanctity, and, and she raised a saint, you see. So the, the child is very much in her hands, and so she uh, also she advises her husband, and her husband should ask her for advice because she uh, knows the day-to-day -day workings of the house. She knows the children probably better than he does. And so he should not treat her as some sort of servant or as some, somebody that slaves around the house. Uh, she is his helper. And that's an important thing to understand because in every business, in every uh, everything, there is a number one and a number two. And the number one person obviously directs the president of the corporation or the chairman of the board directs, but he very much relies on his subordinates. And the subordinates do all the work. They, they carry out his orders. And uh, if you didn't have this subordination, you would have no coordination. That is a principle of philosophy, that there is no coordination unless there is subordination. So the family, which is the God-given and God-established society upon which all societies are modeled, must have this subordination in order to have coordination. So just as if you had many presidents in a corporation, it would be chaos where everyone's giving orders and nobody's doing anything. It would be chaos. So also in the family, if there is not a subordination of the the wife to the husband, there is chaos. And I think that that is the, my opinion, the cause of these children who go around shooting their, their uh, schoolmates, etc. The, the, the family is chaotic and it has a severe psychological, it makes a severe psychological burden upon the child. He is disoriented. Things are messed up in the home, so to speak. And uh, that that's uh, children are very very sensitive to those things. They don't even like to hear their parents fight. You know, even you know, all all husbands and wives occasionally <laughs> fight. All right, let's we know that. Okay, they don't even like to hear that. Uh, it, it 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 disturbs them. It makes them feel insecure. But when there is a a chaos between husband and wife, uh, and there's no order in the home, they are severely damaged by that and then in certain cases do terrible things. Um, just to follow up to that, uh, Your Excellency, which is what if the husband wishes to make a decision that the wife probably might have more information and probably might make a more reasoned and she wants to maybe contradict or just say, uh, look, uh, maybe this is not the best decision that you're making. What's the way to do it uh, to, to, to kind of go and change the decision, so to speak? Well, she should try to influence her husband by reason. Uh, the uh, reason it controls everything, uh, ultimately. All law must be in accordance with reason. So she should appeal to reason. She should not get emotional. Uh, she should say, I know this, I know that. Uh, this seems to be more reasonable. If he is reasonable, he will go along with it. I mean, just by comparison, I am a superior here in the in the seminary. I think that the priests will tell you that whenever I make a decision, I ask them, "What what do you think? Should we do this? Any kind of big decision? Uh, what what is your opinion about this?" And I, I hear them, and and I generally will not make a, a decision without listening to them. Any kind of significant or big decision, and that's true of the of the Roman Catholic Institute as well. Uh, people who are in a, a high position uh, should listen to their subordinates and get info, information, and, and reaction from their subordinates uh, in order to make a good decision. Uh, who is so infallible, except the Pope when he's speaking, uh, <laughs> who is so infallible that he uh, would have so much uh, confidence in himself to make those decisions? 
So the husband should be reasonable with his wife and treat his wife as someone who has input. But ultimately, the decision lies with him, and she has to understand that. And uh, Your Excellency, what was it like in the past where you had big families? Did, did parents live with their children? Did, and how did that affect decision-making? Let's say you became the father of a household. Did your mother and, and aged father live with you? And, and how did that dynamic work within the Catholic families? Yes, well, really in all families, uh, people did not have as much money as they do now. There was no social security 100 years ago. So old people were not collecting any funds. Uh, so typically they lived with their children, their married children. Now, I have to say this though, that in uh, when social security in the United States was founded in the 1930s, the average life expectancy was 67, right? Uh, now it's much higher. So there are other factors now. Uh, when people uh, get older now, they go into dementia, they go into uh, various uh, physical problems, they fall down, for example. So it may be necessary that they go to a rehabilitation center or someplace where uh, they can be cared for. Uh, typically in this country, if an old person falls down two or three times, the emergency services will say, we're not coming back. You know, this person has to go into some some form of care. Mm -hmm. So that is a factor that was not true, say, 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. Uh, the, the people are living longer. So it could be necessary that uh, you place your, your elderly people in, in some sort of professional care. But ordinarily, they should be cared for up to the, the time that that becomes necessary. They should be cared for by their children, their married children, or their unmarried children, for that matter. Uh, the uh, and also their presence as grandparents in the family is good for the children. They, as you get older, let me tell you, uh, <laughs> you, you have a lot of experience, and uh, <laughs> you can give some good advice. So the grandparent uh, contributes, but again, the grandparent in that case must respect the authority of the husband in the in the family, the f husband and father in the family. So they should not uh, uh, in any way trespass with regard to that. Very good. And people have children too. Uh, and, uh, you know, life was a lot different. Maybe one would go to college. That's what was typical. The others would, uh, you know, if you graduated from high school in the 1930s, you were well-educated. Uh, <laughs> and maybe one would go to college. College was a place to learn Latin and English literature and music and art, and uh, now it's trade school. Mm. See, most people go to college in order to learn something uh, whereby they can make money. Practically everything is geared towards something by which to make money, you know, and it could be whether it's the medical field or lawyers, or it's, it's always some sort of trade. And uh, the, uh, so, it, college at that time was all different. It was a refining uh, aspect of your life, and uh, you would uh, be, you know, very much uh, finished off. You might say culturally, by by, or or maybe finished off is not the right word. Finished culturally <laughs> by going to college. Now you're finished off. <laughs> but culturally, <laughs> you're you're you were uh, improved by your college education, and maybe one would go to college. Let's see. Traditionally, how many children did a Catholic family have 50, 60, 70 years ago? Now it's the millennial generation. It's absolutely cratered. It's, it's most, most are unmarried. If not, it's one or two children. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, it was typically six, seven, eight, you know, I would say average Catholic family. There was no artificial birth control. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe some some bad Catholics did that, but as a rule, Catholic families would be very large, maybe 10, 12. Uh, and uh, they respected the, the natural law with regard to birth control. And, uh, the, you know, they, they had a lot of children. And uh, so the, uh, but now, yes, I mean, the many races are e e e extinguishing themselves uh, by the practice of birth control and abortion. The European races are just going out of existence, uh, effectively. 
It's very sad. And, and many other races too. And Your Excellency, um, what was the tradition for children going into the religious life? Was there some, did the eldest go to the, was the eldest held to be, maybe this is medieval times, I'm not sure of the history, but if you had a family of eight, was did the parents plan ahead or was it just uh, whoever had the inclination and the the talent and the, the, the move, were moved to become religious? In the Middle Ages, the eldest son would inherit the property. The second son would go into the military and the third son would go into the church. That was the expectation, you know, now, now how much they enforced that, I don't know, but that was the medieval uh, way. Uh, no, uh, there, there should be no pressure on, uh, on any child to embrace religious life. Uh, what parents should do is say, the best thing that you can do with your life is to become a priest or religious. That's the best thing you can do with the days that are given to you in life. But you must be inclined to it and you must be qualified for it. Qualified in all ways, morally and intellectually and, and health-wise. So just to encourage it, but never to force it. That, that should be. And if they express an interest uh, it should be, uh, there should be a mild rejoicing. Oh, that's a wonderful idea, Johnny or Mary. Uh, and uh, let's uh, hope that God gives you the grace to pursue that, etc. There, there should be no force and uh, just just rejoicing that that is the path that they've chosen. That's all. Excellent. Um, now, I, I didn't know this, but doing a little bit of research, I learned about the medieval temperaments and... Um, they're very interesting, especially when you have children and you are, they're very useful, I, I, I would imagine, in dealing with discipline and dealing with how to understand your child. Your Excellency, could you explain briefly the medieval temperaments and how parents should consider them when raising their children? Do you mean the four temperaments? Yes. Uh, they're not called they medieval. The Greeks. They come oh. from the Greeks, the oh. ancient Greeks. <laughs> <Yes. Okay. laughs> I got the history on. wrong. <laughs> Yeah, they, they are very old. Uh, yes, yeah, so you have the four temperaments, the, the choleric, the sanguine, the melancholic, and the phlegmatic. And this is not superstition. No, no, no. It's very real. Um, now, these are uh, four tendencies. That's all they are, are tendencies to act. In other words, the your first instinct would be ordinarily to act act according to one of these in these four temperaments. They are based on passion. Uh, we have passions just like the animals. We have emotions which are linked to our intellect. Uh, and uh, the, uh, they incline us to act in a certain way. So the choleric is someone who wants to uh, overcome obstacles. He's the mountain climber. And he has to be the king of the mountain when he gets there. That's typical of his inclination. So he will, uh, he's capable of very great good things. And many of the saints, like St. Saint Ignatius Loyola, were cholerics. St. Francis Xavier, cholerics. They set the world on fire, or as the British say, they set the Thames on fire. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, uh, you know, they want to, to accomplish great things. On the other hand, they can accomplish very many evil things. See, they, they are capable of great good and great evil. They are not mediocre. See, they're, they're going to do one, one or the other. So in that sense, it is the best of all of them, but it is the most dangerous of all of them. All of the, the, uh, the melancholic uh, is also in the, we might say the anger department, but he has a quiet <laughs> anger. He, he, uh, he uh, is dominated by fear of the, um, of the worst that can happen. See, he's always thinking dark. Uh, it comes from a Greek word, melancholic, from black. You know, he's thinking something dark and, and about to happen, something threatening. And so uh, it, that, that's, he's dominated by that. So he's dominated by fear. Uh, and he's uh, very attentive to um, detail. He's very loyal. He has, he's capable of many, many good virtues. 
uh, but he's slow. Anything he does, <laughs> he will do very thoroughly, but very slowly. You see, uh, the ancient Romans said the mills of the gods grind exceedingly slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. <laughs> a motto of the, and that's melancholic. He's going to grind exceedingly slowly, but exceedingly fine as well. So uh, they too are capable of great virtues, but they have to be careful not to get depressed and so forth. Now, again, these are tendencies. Uh, they are not, doesn't mean that you're a robot of your, of your uh, temperament. It's a tendency. And these, these temperaments are themselves controlled by virtue. And as a matter of fact, the sign of a virtuous person, even a saint, is that you can't tell what temperament he has mm. because it's all honed down by virtue. So he doesn't act according to his instincts or you know, his anger or his whatever dissipation or anything. He acts according to virtue, the will of God in all things. And it's all tempered by the, the virtues, all right? So the other temperament, is, one of the others is sanguine. Sanguine wants to have a party and <laughs> wants to set aside work and dance on a table, you see? He, he's a he's a joker. He's uh he wants to live it up. He wants good food and good wine, and uh, everybody likes him because he's the life of the party. All right, uh, he has a, a lot of good qualities. You know, he is likable. He can do a lot of good with that. But he has a strong tendency to sins of impurity, sins of gluttony, and dissipation and laziness. You see, so. Uh, the but you know they all have their good tendencies and their bad tendencies. You know their the good side. The 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 sanguine was, uh, makes a good. Statement. Was King Henry so the Eighth a, a sanguine? What's that? King King Henry. Henry? The Eighth? Yeah, he was a sanguine. Yes, <laughs> yes. And that shows their their relationships are very um, uh, short lived, and. Uh, they they go from person to person, so to speak. You know, they get excited about somebody and then they drop. And they they because they have a tendency to uh, impurity. Impurity. One of the effects of impurity is a cold heart. And sure enough, you see that in Henry the Eighth, he would fall in love with these various mistresses, and then he would chop their heads off. See, he had a cold heart. If they he didn't like them today, or they he thought that they did something against him, chop their head off. You see. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because really, you're more in love with yourself. Those uh, lust mm -hmm. is a is a form of self love. You you love other people for what they can give to you. you see, and then when that disappears, they're useless. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, they have a, a the the sanguine has a tendency to a, a very strong sin of lust and of uh, concupiscence and and um, uh, gluttony. Mm. See, so he has to watch that, you know. Mm. But on the other hand, they're capable of many virtues. They're very likable. See, so, um, and then the uh, the uh, phlegmatic is somebody who gets along with everybody, is very what we call laid back, calm, and doesn't get anything done. <laughs> All right, they, you know, it, you you can never count on them to finish a project. And I'll give you an example. I was. Yes, this was a test done. They they took people and and uh, analyzed them according to their characters, and they put all the cholerics in one room, they put all the melancholics in one room, all the sanguines in one room, and all the phlegmatics in one room, and they gave them a project to do, each the same project. So they came back a little later, and the cholerics were arguing about who should be in charge of doing the project. They had nothing done. They were arguing with each other. The melancholics were all sitting around. The project was totally done. They were staring at each other and saying nothing. The sanguines were having a party. Nothing was done at all, and they were all having a party. All right. <laughs> and the phlegmatics had it half done, and they were talking and chatting nicely. <laughs> that pretty much says it. <laughs> you know? Uh, the uh, so so it, as it relates to raising children, it's good to know their temperaments and realize that those are their their tendencies 
So you want to capitalize on the virtuous aspect of the, of the temperament and then mortify the bad aspects of it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, right away you should under, and the same family can have many of different characters and you know, one is, could be quite different from another. They're not all going to be the same. And are there, uh, Your Excellency, are there blended temperaments? So can someone be half choleric, half sanguine, for example? Uh, they say that. Uh, I don't buy it. Uh, I think that there is a, uh, the very term for temperaments, there is a dominant tendency. Now, you could have, yes, you know, but everybody's got some lower tendency. I mean, the, the choleric isn't going to always be nasty. Uh, he'll be sanguine once in a while, you know. I, I just think that there's a dominant uh, and uh, I, I really don't buy it, the, the, the joining them like that. But uh, the, that dominant tendency will come out at an early age. Uh, and, the, uh, and also it should be noted that the discipline that is given at the early ages is much more efficacious than later. That those first five years are, are very, very formative of the child. Uh, it's impossible after they're about 12 or 13. I mean, they, they are hardened. It's like hardened clay. There's, there's nothing left to do. And, you know, many times parents will have raised their children badly and then regret it by the time that the, their, the children are teenagers and are going astray. And they are going astray because in most cases, not all, in most cases, they have been badly raised. Your Excellency, um, that's a great segue to discipline. Uh, discipline um, is such a mystery, I think, in the modern age for many modern families because, well, I think many families struggle with discipline. And there are many books that people write and buy, and there's this whole marketplace for, for a child psychologists trying to teach how best to raise your children. So, Your Excellency, what, how was discipline implemented in a Catholic family? Well, first of all, there was... A, a very strong sense of the law, authority and law, and that is lacking very much in modern families. They're treating their children as if they were adults. Uh, the, uh, the authority of the father must be very, very present and felt, and uh, the mother should carry out his instructions, you see, that order and law. Uh, is very important, that whole atmosphere. The, and then there must be uh, in, in the uh, instruction of the child. Of course, in a Catholic home, there must be the instruction concerning the faith and why the, the authority of the father comes from God and that they are uh, indirectly obeying God when they you know, obey or disobey, uh, they're disobeying God. Uh, so the, the Catholic discipline adds all of that supernatural aspect to it. Uh, but uh, even on the natural plane, there, there should be uh, law and order. Wherever there is a transgression, it should be punished. Where there is an extraordinary virtue, it should be rewarded. Not ordinary virtue. You don't give you know, someone a piece of cake because he was a good boy that day. <laughs> Some sort of extraordinary virtue should be rewarded and transgressions should be consistently punished. Consistency is of absolute necessity. Uh, many parents have what I call volcanic discipline. That is, the kids run wild. Ordinarily, they do things that are, are absolutely uh, outside of the law and outside of their proper discipline. And then once in a while, the parent blows up and screams and yells and, and does, you know, and then the kids just run away from him. You see? That is not discipline. And sometimes they think of themselves as great disciplinarians because they blow up once in a while. No, it should be a day-to-day -day, uh, order. And the discipline should be given, whatever discipline it is, in perfect calm. And if the parent is not calm, he should calm down before he gives the discipline. Because people don't listen to you when you're screaming and yelling. They understand that you are out of control. If, if it, just like in a court, when the, when the judge gives the sentence and gives instructions, he does so very, very uh, calmly. 
It could be a terrible sentence, but he does it calmly. Everybody listens. And when you do things calmly, you're doing things with reason. You should also un tell the child why he is being punished and, and, and the gravity of what he did. And uh, all of those things, the child should be given reasons, but not where uh, they demand reason. In other words, if they say why, you don't answer why. The answer why is it is the law. That's why. You see, but you don't say, well, we, we don't think it's good for you or something like that. Or you, you don't, he has to understand law and order. That is Catholic discipline. Uh, later on, when they become young adults, you can tell them why you think it's wrong for them to do that. But they can't handle that as kids, and they get a, a an attitude that if I don't agree with it, I'm not going to do it. Mm. You see, and that's, that's very, very destructive. Mm. Uh, it's subjectivist and and leads to rebellion. You see, but right. many parents do that. I see it all the time. Yes, very and much so. Never say, "Oh, Johnny, please be good." Never <laughs> say that. Never, never say please, Johnny. Be good. <laughs> uh, a command, not oh, please be good. Uh, oh. They should respond to you simply by a look. You n merely should have to look at them with a certain look for them to calm down and be good. Great Just advice, look. Your Excellency. And then you know that you you are disciplining correctly. With regard to education, Your Excellency. There are many, um, I, I know in the modern age, we have, obviously, there's public school, which is not really ideal in any sense of the word. Um, but people have turned to homeschooling. They've turned to Montessori, Reggio Emilia. There's a whole host of educational um, paths in the modern age. But I'm very interested in the Catholic, uh, what a, like, for instance, a Catholic school. What is a typical educational path that a parent should try to put their children through and to get a good formation? Well, ideally, a Catholic school. A Catholic school is going to complement everything you're doing at home. And I say that because if you're not doing it at home, the Catholic school is worthless. If you are not disciplining your children at home, if you are not giving them piety, if you are not giving them a Catholic life at home, the Catholic school is worthless. The Catholic school is the icing on the cake. You make the cake, we put the icing on. It is complementary to what you're doing at home, but the home is the principal place in which the faith is known and learned and practiced through discipline. See, And so if you're not doing that, you need to do that. That's the first education is the, the discipline and faith of the home, all right, and piety of the home. Uh, the, the, uh, so that's number one. I mean, that's the first consideration. Secondly, you must keep them away from the horrors of modern education at any price, any price at all. You so cannot agree. send them to the slaughterhouse. And if they go to the slaughterhouse and they're slaughtered, whose responsibility is that? Who is, who is guilty before God? If they're going and learning about CRT and LS, whatever, you know, transgenders and whatnot, uh, and, and all sorts of liberal ideas, I mean, even apart from those, uh, many liberal ideas, liberal attitudes, their friends are all liberal, they're all answering back to their parents, they t they're watching dirty things on television, they're looking at dirty things on their phones. You, you cannot send your child into that. He will become that. And you will be responsible. So you have to uh, take whatever means are necessary to, to uh, avoid that. Secondly, I would say this, to say to your children over and over again, it would be better that you're selling pencils on the street rather than to lose your soul in a good job. All right? Say that over and over again, that the most important thing in life is the salvation of your soul. You should be obsessed with the salvation of your soul. Everything else must be subject to that goal. And if something in any way if interferes with that goal, it must be eliminated, all right? That must be said over and over again. 
Many parents want their children to succeed, and of course we all do, but succeed at the price of their souls. So my son is a doctor, my son is a lawyer, see, and he has a beautiful home and three cars and a beautiful second or third wife, you see? At the divorce and remarriage, you know, and isn't she wonderful? They approve of all of that stuff. And the, for all intents and purposes, those people are going to hell. I mean, only God knows and, you know, but I'm saying that for all intents, as we can observe, they are on a path to hell. And these are these come from families that are strong Catholics, etc. But they have raised their children according to the norms of the modern world, and they have held out to them success, worldly success. You must be something. You must make something of yourself. <clears throat> uh, and uh, at the price of their their the salvation of their souls. Now it is true that you have to have a job. <laughs> I'm not saying you should sell puzzles <laughs> on the street, but you have to choose. Uh, uh, jobs that are not going to compromise your faith. And, and, and I would, uh, especially in this context uh, of what we're living through today, I would, I would encourage them in, to go for the trades and to own their own businesses if possible, and those, especially the boys, but also the girls to have, for example, they could learn something whereby they could support themselves in the event that their husband dies or is disabled or, God forbid, abandons them and with a family. That's not bad. It's just that the idea of uh, of some worldly and and glitzy, let's say, uh, um, job is something that should not be held out to them, in my opinion. Because you can't you can't go for those things without going to those schools that are going to corrupt you. When you say Catholic school, you don't mean the current when people think catholic school there are catholic schools in name but really they're they might be more they might be more liberal <laughs> than the public schools in some some regards yeah, so schools yeah. they're, they're not catholic and so, schools so, you're, Novus Ordite. so we have to be clear for people listening that they that yes. the, don't go to those particular schools because they could be very harmful no. to, to the morals and faith no a catholic school is one where the catholic faith prevails and the catholic faith does not prevail in those places your Excellency, I had a question about play for children. Now, fantasy play, as is, is that something to be encouraged? Sometimes some parents take like they overindulge, and children almost live in a dream world. How much fantasy is allowed in a child when they're growing up? Um, in terms of just you know, just spending time in a dreamy state, and how much should be cold reality and focusing on on day to day uh, the realities of life? Well, fantasy is a form of entertainment, and all entertainment must be accidental to what is substantial. And what is substantial is preparation for life. Uh, the Romans used to take their, the Roman senators used to take their boys into the Senate in order that they learn government. Yes. <laughs> you see, the, the, uh, and there's, and, the young boys in the Middle Ages would learn military things. They would learn how to ride horses and, and uh, use a sword. And many of them were going into and leading, even leading battle when they were 16, 17, 18 years old. Uh, the, uh, today, kids are living in, a, as you say, a dream world. That, you know, their phone has you know, YouTube and entertainment should only, and all recreation should be accidental to what is substantial. And what is substantial is your duties of state and life what you should be doing. And a child has duties of state and life, such as maybe cleaning his room or doing something that pertains to the household order. And those are all preparatory to his what he will do later. He should also uh, learn uh, higher things. He should learn, for example, uh, uh, music and uh, something about art, and which is not really entertainment. Those are intellectual things that are uplifting. Entertainment is watching some stupid movie, and or, or and once in a while we all have to watch a stupid movie. You know, I'm not <laughs> saying we all have to be, because uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas says we recreate in order to work better, and sometimes we have to rest our bodies and we have to rest our minds. So I'm not eliminating that, but it has to be all in order. And yes, I agree with you. Kids are in a dream world. They grow up and they're 30 years old. They're still living with their parents. They, they don't know what they want to do when they grow up. 
and and they're dependent on their parents and their parents spoil them. They give them money. They let them live in the house. They should kick them out and say, go get a, an honest job, you know, but they have not been prepared for that. Hmm. See, the child should be given chores. He should be given an allowance because he does the chores. If he doesn't do his chores, his allowance gets cut. Uh, the the And then he should go out and get summer jobs or he should mow lawns or do other things as he gets older. Uh, paper routes. We just, they don't do paper routes anymore. We, <laughs> that's how old I am. At least. <laughs> uh, but uh, we always had some sort of job, you know, as something that gave us a little money. And, and, uh, and they should be able to keep the money and manage their own money. And when they spend it all on stupid things, they should be chided for having spent it on stupid things. They should be told you should save your money and spend it wisely. You see that, and then they grow up to to learn that. You see, it's but really yeah, I agree with you. the The fantasy world business must be stopped. To related to that, Your Excellency, streaming services like Amazon Prime, Netflix almost dominate every household. Apple, YouTube. Should the family just toss the television and in some regards the internet out of the house, at least, you know, I mean, until there's some age of reason or even beyond? Well, I used to say when there was only television, I used to say throw a brick through your television set. <laughs> you know, when there was no internet or anything. But unfortunately, we are so dependent on internet for legitimate things like airline reservations or information just good information um, a latin dictionary or a that it's hard to to say just get rid of it all but i would say this and this is our policy in our schools that young persons including teenagers may not look at the internet unless the parent is sitting there right so if they have to look up something or even if they want to watch a movie or do something the parent must be sitting there you cannot let children use their what's on their phones or use the internet at home un, unattended and unsupervised. They can look, I don't have to tell you, at the most disgusting things and be corrupted totally. It's so easy. It comes up, you know, even when you're looking for something legitimate, those filthy pictures come up, etc. So, you know, kids are curious and, and they would not necessarily resist those things. Uh, as an adult might, uh, you know, a, a good, pious adult might just turn it off. But they get curious. And uh, so I, that's what I would say to parents, that you have the responsibility of keeping them away from those things unless they have a good reason to be on it. And that could be entertainment. It could be. But they must be supervised. What sort of educational materials and books should be in the house of a Catholic family? And, and sorts of literature and ideal sorts of books that children can reach for if they would like to read something? Uh, I, I am not a big fan of what we call English literature. Uh, most English literature was written by Freemasons and Protestants. And <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to associate with uh, Puritans like uh, Milton, you know, who was very anti-Catholic. Mm. Um, uh, so, uh, and then you have the Victorian novels, which, you know, are kind of silly. Uh, <laughs> well, they are. You know, it, it's Jane Eyre or, you know, uh, Wuthering Heights, those, those things, or screaming through the, through the moors of York. Uh, <laughs> the, I don't think those are really edifying things. Uh, I think maybe Lives of the Saints or some history books, in other words, that, that they could handle. Again, history you have to watch because they talk about some of the escapades of the monarchs and all, but it's something that is made for children. Uh, uh, again, that's reality. It's not fantasy. You see, it's reality. This is history, and this is something that happened. Uh, it, and I, by that, I don't want to exclude all fantasy because, as I said, once in a while, we all have to watch a stupid movie. <laughs> but the, just to remind you can get overwhelmed and, and your mind can start burning up a little bit. It's true. You but know, Your Excellency, happens. wasn't there a Catholic league back in the day that gave us at least a, gave us good films to watch? What happened to those yes, films? The can, we still, of can we still watch those films? I mean, I know they're black and white 
but uh, yes, what? Yes, uh, yes, those could be watched. Yes, the A1. What is what was designated A1? And I think that's available on the internet. Those those designations. If you go to Legion of Decency, uh, you know, uh, like Ben Hur was A1. Ben Hur was probably the best movie ever made, and it, it's a very edifying movie, and and uh, many others which are decent. Uh, you, you don't want to become so, uh, how would you say, overwhelmed that you become practically depressed and unable to enjoy life. There has to be a legitimate enjoyment of life. Everything according to reason and balance uh, and dictated by the law of God. You know, that, that's, that's really the formula, but you don't want to be weird. <laughs> uh, and very quickly, Your Excellency, multilingualism, I know you are a scholar and you know many languages, should into the modern age should I understand that some children will learn Latin in, 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 in a Catholic school, but perhaps more languages as someone who speaks multiple languages, can you attest to any benefit to that? Absolutely. Uh, I always tell the seminarians, there should be no book on the shelf that you cannot read. And <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of books on the shelf. Many of them are in French, mostly, you know, the foreign ones are mostly French, some Spanish, uh, some German, some Italian. Uh, the five great European languages should be learned, but first Latin, because Latin uh, was a living language of the church, for one thing. Secondly, it organizes your, your grammatical mind and, and prepares you for other languages that are organized according to Latin. So uh, the uh, particularly the Romance languages and also German. German was organized in the late Middle Ages according to Latin and Greek. Uh, so it, it it you you see grammar. You see grammar is so important, and so Latin is the first thing you should learn, and then get into the other languages. But uh, and then I tell them if you really want to be well educated, you should know Greek and Hebrew too. So the five great European languages and then Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. And then you can call yourself well educated. I'm Excellent. kidding. <laughs> but what, what are the five? What are the five uh, great European languages? Uh, German, Italian, Spanish, French, and English. Okay, okay, that's a tall order, but, you but know I think that's five. a good thing. You're going to be able to read a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, children in college, for boys and for girls. Boys should they go through technical trades like engineering or? Or and can girls do engineering? So what is the what is the Catholic perspective on education for children of both sexes? Well, first of all, I would say go for the trades, and engineering is a trade. Go for anything that will not expose you to the horror, you know. But you want to to avoid English, history, all of those liberal arts subjects, psychology, sociology, <laughs> all that garbage. You want to just do the numbers in architecture or something else like that, uh, and uh, but also plumbing and electric electricians. You know that's all great, and you'll always have a job. Everyone will need electricity, and everyone will need plumbing. You know, so uh, and uh, uh, business administration. But again, you have to watch that because sometimes they get get into those other things. You know, uh, so trades, but uh, the. Um, I would say to girls, uh, look, you have to decide what you're going to do. Either become a religious, get married, or not get married. If you're getting married, you have to give up whatever job you have, What even if you're a doctor, if you're a, a lawyer, and raise your children. And also be a helper to your husband. Many times they think, well, I have no children, so I can go out and do whatever I want. You are a helper to the husband. You keep the home. And the order of the home is a very important part of being married, that the husband should come home to an orderly house, and there should be dinner on the table, and, and, and everything should be clean and in order. Very important. It's underestimated with regard to the stability of the home. So she is the helper to the husband and also the mother to the children. In most cases, there are children. So. So if you want to pursue a big career, then decide you're not getting married. It, if, if you want to say, I won't get married, I'll go into business, I'll go into something else, uh, 
she's free to do that and she might be very good in it. You know, there's very intelligent women and in many cases they're better than men at some things. Yes. Uh, but they, they don't think that you're going to get married, go on birth control and then go out and pursue your career. That, that is the modern world. And I don't have to tell you that. And uh, where they're double income, and, you know, you've heard the term of a dink, double income, no kids. Those are dinks. Uh, the, the, uh, that is unacceptable, but there's going to be that temptation. You see, well, we've bought the dream home for, you know, $450,000 because we want dessert first. And then we're going to go on birth control until I'm 35 and I will go out and make $300,000 a year because I'm a lawyer or something like that. And then we'll have a child, you know, when I'm 35 and then, uh, I'll put the child uh, eventually in daycare and then I'll go back and make $350,000 a year. You know, the, that is the modern world. That's America. I, you know, I don't know if it's the same where you live, but that's America. That is totally unacceptable. Utterly totally, that, but that is typical. It's even expected. The role of mother and wife is full-time. It's 48 hours a day. All right. And she's got to give her full time to that. And what she will do with regard to her children is far more noble than anything she would do in the business world. We don't love Our Lady and praise her because she went to Jerusalem to work in a factory or to be a CEO in, in you know, some big city in, in Rome or something like that. We venerate her supremely because she was the mother of of Jesus, and she formed him. That's why we love her so much. And if she had done anything else, if she had put, God forbid, to even think about this, put him in a in a you know, some sort of daycare center and went off and pursued her career, I mean, could you even think about that? <laughs> it's just, it's it's almost it's dreadful to think about it. But we we venerate her because she was a mother. You see, and, and the, the mother does far more good in the home than she could ever do. Anybody can be a CEO. Anybody can be an architect, an engineer, all of those things. Anybody can, as long as you have the brains to do it. But not anyone can form her own children. Very well said, Your Excellency. I have two final questions for you. Right. I want to actually just jump a little bit back. I'm a music teacher, and I'd love to get your take on music in the home. Uh, it's it's so the 20th century has been kind of bad for music in many ways. Uh, what kind of music should children listen to that's not disordered, <laughs> and what should they listen to for leisure? Well, I can just tell you my own experience. I was listening to classical music when I was five years old. All right, <laughs> so <laughs> and uh, I was born in 1950. And Elvis Presley came out with You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog song. Now, this I remember it. <laughs> and my older brother got the record and played it. And I said to my father, I want an Elvis Presley record too. And my father said, you're not getting an Elvis Presley record because we <laughs> listen to that garbage. And, and he was a well-educated man. And he said, I'll give you a record. And we went down to the record store and he picked out a record, which I still have to this day. <laughs> the 1956, okay? I have it still. Classical music for those who know nothing about classical music. And that... All the hits. I was finished after that. I mean, I, I cannot be in the same room with rock music. The, the, so I would say, train your children on chant. Mm. It trains the, their ear very nicely. It's pure music. It has no set rhythm. It's pure melody. And, and uh, so a lot of chant, Renaissance, Palestrina, and then the, the Baroque period and the classical period. Some romantic is good, but romantic is already getting into corruption. Uh, you know, uh, you have to be, you should educate them about the different uh, styles and and you have a, a departure from reason in romantic. See Mozart and Bach. They, that's all according to mat mathematical proportion. See, there's no picture or emotion that they are portraying. 
Whereas you get into Brahms or Wagner, uh, it's a it's a movie basically, or it's movie music. You know, it's all of this emotion, and and so I would say, although they might be great composers, they were writing in an idiom that is inferior to what I would call mathematical music, uh, which is totally rational. You see, like a, a Mozart piano concerto is not movie music. In other words, it, it's totally rational. You, 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 the progression of everything, the harmony is all in accordance with reason. Bach is so rational that you know what's coming. <laughs> you know, you know what should, and he does it. You know, you know it exactly. Uh, Your I Excellency, listening. what about opera? The church has complained about opera over the ages. and it's filthy. Uh... <laughs> it's filthy. It's dirty. Filthy stories. There are occasion. It's true. All of it is dirt. And there are an occasional, uh, there's an occasional nice music from it. And they could listen maybe to an aria from it that uh, is, you know, is very beautiful. But opera, I would completely keep them away from. It's, it's just, uh, just a lot of dirt put to music <laughs> filthy dirty morals put to music right. triangular loves love scenes and everything you know. and your excellency um what about swing music of, of the 20s and like frank sinatra and that sort of thing <laughs> and jazz yeah, music you probably know. well jazz let me tell you this jazz if you look in the cassell's book of of uh of uh, word origins jazz was the uh, name given to sexual intercourse in the houses of prostitution, the black houses of prostitution in New Orleans. That's where it comes from. He also says rock and roll also means the same thing. And he says, isn't it interesting that the modern music uh, today comes from two things that mean the same thing, sexual mm -hmm. intercourse. Very base. That should tell you everything about it. They, I don't have to. I don't know anything about the technique of music, but there there are sounds and in rock music and in popular music that are off. In other words, they are they don't make you sit up; they make you slouch. See, jazz makes you slouch in your chair, and of course, it was preparatory to what was going to go on later. You see, whereas Mozart makes you sit up, Haydn makes you sit up. Uh, Bach makes you sit up. It's intellectual and it's formal. See, whereas all of those other 20th century uh, styles uh, are, are uh, all I can say is they are not the standard music. And those, the, the, the various chords and whatnot, the progressions are not in accordance with standard music. And they are uh, grossly inferior, intellectually, grossly inferior to anything that you would learn in classical music. So I would say, forget about all of that stuff. Do the great classics. This might be a naive question, uh, Your Excellency, but Bach was a Lutheran. Is that still okay to listen to his music? Yes, it is, because uh, it really has nothing to do with his religion. Uh, the uh, even his cantatas, his Lutheran cantatas, uh, don't contain anything uh, heretical. I mean, it's all just basically praise of God and various and sacred scripture. You know, no, that uh, uh, Mozart was a Freemason. You know, but he wrote masses and very the litanies of the Blessed Sacrament and all. No, it really has nothing to do with it. Handel okay. was a Protestant. He wrote the Messiah. You know, the it has nothing to do with it. There, there were some Catholics who, uh, I'm trying to think of some Catholic composers. Uh, in the 19th century, well, Bruckner was, was Catholic. He wrote, I would call him a grade B composer, though. Uh, you know, in, in the, the 19th French, century. Uh, César Franck and... Uh, uh, Greg B. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd love to speak with you again, uh, Your Excellency, yeah. on music. There was a, uh, I have to say personally, just... I think one of the things, as we end off, uh, one of the things that really struck me, I think, was your Modern Errors course, the one that's on YouTube and the Roman Catholic media. And it really moved me so much because um, I never understood as a, when I was growing up, a very liberal trajectory. And I always thought subjectivism music was this cornucopia of sound that you all imbibed. And it was good to be as widely listened to as possible. 
and maybe we could end off with this. What is the point of music, uh, and why did God create music? And I'd love to t- get uh, get your all, take on that. All art, all art, and this is the the Thomist view of it, is an imitation of nature. So pictorial art wants to imitate nature. God is the ultimate artist in the sense that He made the most beautiful things, and our art should imitate it. All right. So pictorial art wants to to show beautiful things, the order of creation, and and whether it's human beings or whether it's even just an apple or something like that, it wants to manifest the order of creation. And it will it go beyond the photograph. It will show things that perhaps are seen only by the intellect and not by the senses. You know. So music also wants to imitate nature. There, there is there is a natural eight tone scale, and there is a natural proportion between those things. That's why something sounds off when you <laughs> hit the wrong note. I'll tell you uh, just quickly. I was listening to I was uh, listening to an organ concert once, and I was up in the choir loft, and this lady played a Bach fugue perfectly. Then she played Vidor. You know, the doors, uh, the yep. big, yep. and you know, it's all over the place. The, you know, she had five. You know, and so I said to her afterwards, what was more difficult, the Vidor or the Bach? She says, oh, by far the Bach. Just like that. And I said, why? She said, if I'm one note off in Bach, everybody hears it. <laughs> and the reason for that is that there is a natural proportion between all of the notes and you can know a sour note as soon as you hear it. Whereas in, in modern music, and it starts with the, the romantic, the sour is, you know, the, the, that loss of natural proportion is there. You see, and again, that's subjectivistic. It's the human mind imposing itself on nature, which is subjectivism and Kantianism. And that eventually translates into transgenderism and all of the garbage that we're listening to today. See, when, when we decide what, what will be proportionate, when we decide nature, see how it rebels against God, who is the author of nature. The birds sure. sing in eight-tone scales. <laughs> very well put, Your Excellency. Well, it's been a very edifying and enlightening chat with you, Your Excellency. I thank you for being generous with your time. I'm really thankful for the work that you do and your priests um, over the years because I can't tell you how many hours of your sermons I have playing. Oh. I mean, it just it just plays, and I'm and I'm not the only one. There are many people who just binge. I don't know if you've heard that term, binge watch. <laughs> <laughs> they binge watch, and so please, um, I wish you good health, and I wish you, you and your, the Roman Catholic Institute to continue to do your great, important work. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you hopefully soon in the future. All right, thank you very much. Oh.